Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontifrac, in the house today. Mary Olson Menzel. Mary, it's great to see you. A short bio of you, what you're up to, and your new fabulous book, and then we'll get right into it. So Mary has over 30 years of leadership experience across media, tech, healthcare, and other industries right around the world. She's the founder and the CEO of MVP Executive Development, a national leadership, coaching, and organizational management consultancy with offices in New York, Connecticut, and Illinois. Her clients range from, get this, Fortune 500 companies to startups with a broad range of industries from fintech to the National Football League. As a seasoned executive leadership coach, Mary works with both companies and individuals to unlock the potential that improves business performance and catalyzes growth. Her coaching methods, which we'll probably get into, bring a fresh lens to the business uh, and perspective that nurtures teamwork and helps drive results through grace, empathy, and humane leadership. Her new book, Fabulous, is titled, What Lights You Up, Illuminate Your Path, and Take the Next Big Step in your career. Mary, great to see you. Great to have you. Thanks for being here. We're going to dig right into it. There's a line in the book that pops up a couple times, uh, which I loved, which I want to talk about to set the tone for probably uh, the sort of inner light metaphor that you use throughout the book. And the line is as follows. You write, your passion, your purpose, your skills, and your personality will equal your paycheck. That's a profound line. So why don't we start there and then we'll unpack sort of the metaphor and and what the book's about. That sounds great, Dan. So that specific line is really very much encompassing that we have to look at each other as whole people, right? And it's not just our career and our skill set and the path that we've chosen. It's more about what is inside of us that is driving us to do what we do. And then that light, which is kind of like your charisma, Um, you know, what is it that is lighting you up inside, but also pushing you forward, that inner voice that's pushing you forward and helping you elevate your gifts and bring them to the workforce. And so the light metaphor, which obviously not only is in the title, but it's used throughout, uh, it's wonderful. And you pause it, however, in the book that you reckon about 70% of the workforce is quote not lit up, and uh, to me, as a as an individual that studies culture, organizations, this thing called employee engagement, et cetera, which to me is a bit of a myth. What does this seventy percent mean to you? This sort of uh, lack of uh, being lit up, or lack of an inner light, or lack of light in general? Yeah, I mean, it, honestly, Dan, the, it, through my years of experience, I've seen the difference that you know, happens in the work, you know, in the workplace, basically between being lit up, right, enjoying what you do, getting your head off the pillow, excited for your day, and just going through the motions. And, you know, not everybody is miserable at their jobs, per se. But there are many who are doing it because they think they should be doing it, or because they think they have to continue down one career path or another. And I think it's really important to start looking at why am I doing what I'm doing? And where do I want to go from here? I was reflecting a little bit on my own career. Here I am 53 times around the sun. And I recall uh, I was never using a light metaphor. And I certainly didn't feel lit up. When I um, was growing up, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And I was relatively smart, I guess. And so got into pre-med at McGill University. But then I realized right away that there was something about being a doctor that wasn't really going to fuel my fire forever. And I kind of came to this realization, Mary, that, you know what, doctors, as good as they are and what they what we need in this planet, help people get back to some version of 100% uh, based on whatever illness they might have or ailment, et cetera. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be a teacher. And the reason I switched was that, oh, I can help people become more than what they are. And so I taught high school for two years. And from there, I thought, oh, geez, like, I don't think this is my thing. So I wasn't lit up to be a doctor or a physiotherapist, which was another path I was uh, uh, looking at. 
I, I went and did a degree, well, two, to be a teacher. I taught for two years, and I was like, this is just not me. And I was kind of the reflection thinking about the book, and when reading, I was like, yeah, I didn't know there I was dimmed or I wasn't lit up, but that's exactly what happened to me. So you, my point being is that, is it is it fair that we, it should be um, us constantly analyzing whether we're lit up? And is this part of the process when we should be rethinking a little bit about our career at every moment along the way? Like, tell us a bit about when we should be analyzing whether we're lit up or not. I think you're, you, you've kind of hit it spot on, Dan. It, you, you should be checking in with yourself regularly, right? And so whether that means daily or weekly or whatever your pace feels like, you were smart enough, intuitive, intuitive enough to actually pivot at an early age. You said, okay, wait, I think I want this. And then you realized, no, okay, it's time to move. Where am I going to make the biggest impact, right? And where am I going to get the most joy out of my career? So that takes constant reflection at all times of our lives, because at you know different times in our lives, we're at different points. We might have a need for more money when we have kids in college. We might have, you know, a need for more time when our kids are young. You know, compensation and and what brings you joy and satisfaction in your days can shift mm. as your life stages shift. Yes, and if we're, I guess we're not. If we're not reflecting to your earlier point, we could probably be pigeonholing ourselves and ending up in that seventy percent of misery if we're not reflecting. Is that fair? Fair. And I wouldn't say it's 70% misery, but it's 70% settling. <laughs> okay, right? fair enough. Yeah. Maybe there's maybe there's a 30% misery and a 40% of people who are just settling and kind mm -hmm. of going through the motions of their day to day instead of like getting up and embracing what their work is. So over the past uh, several years, in fact, you have devised sort of a methodology that finds its way into the book. Um, kind of pivot, or I was going to say pivoting, but rolling around the idea of the MVP 360 pivot program. And so just help us understand, unpack that a little bit. What is this methodology and how might it have helped me back in the, the days of 1990 through 1996-ish, I would say? Yeah, back at the same time I was pivoting too, Dan. Uh, we're, <laughs> we were pivoting around the same time together and, and that's okay. And, you know, I think the first thing, one, is just to give yourself grace for whatever experiences you've had. And then to dive into this 10-step methodology, the first thing you do is you just go very, very deep into who you are as a human being. What is, you know, driving you? What is your family situation? What is your earning situation? And then kind of looking, I, I give people actually in the book and in our coaching practice, a 10 step questionnaire to kind of tap into what, who are they at this very moment in time? So they go deep into that where they actually really start to understand, okay, this is my starting point. Where do I want to go from here? And then from there, we kind of pop out and do the nuts and bolts of, you know, your, your job search toolbox, which would be making sure your resume is up to snuff making sure it's clear, concise. It tells the story that you want it to of, of what is going to catch the eye of an interviewer, a future employer. Making sure that your professional profile is robust. I mean, LinkedIn, you know, anywhere else that you have a professional presence, people are looking at that. And actually the fascinating, you know, um, data is that an average recruiter looks at a resume for six seconds, but they spend like 10 times that on your LinkedIn profile. So having interesting things outside of your resume on your LinkedIn profile really helps. So we go from there and then we take you into, okay, now we've got that all up, up and going. How are you talking to people? What is the story you're telling about your career and your life? And we chunk it into, into two different you know, um, areas. One, your pitch, right? Your elevator pitch, so to speak. If you and I met at you know, a party and we were just talking, what would I tell you mm. about the story of my life? And then bigger, right? Your interview. And how do you tell the story of how you got your start chronologically, 
why you made every decision and what you learned and what you accomplished into what brings you to where you are today. And then there's where is where kind of the magic starts to happen. And we go into what I call turning your job search upside down. And we go into the three P's, which is putting together an aspirational list of organizations that you might want to go after that include your usual prospects, your pivots, and your passions. You know, the process itself and the methodology made a lot of sense to me. One of uh, the reflections I had, however, was that there's a lot of people out there that think that branding is part of the marketing department, not for themselves. So this idea of personal branding and sort of self-positioning oneself could be foreign and certainly feel as though it's an out-of-body experience where they're not really supposed to be doing this because that's that's the marketing team job. I'm not a marketeer. So how in your experience, both from the book and what you put in there, because I know the answer, but also in the work that you do with clients, how do you get them seeing such uh, importance with the ideas of personal brand and the positioning uh, actions that you put in the methodology? Well, because it's it's your reputation, right? And you get to the 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 one of the nice things about social media is you actually get to control a little bit of that narrative now. Hmm. Um, whereas your reputation always preceded you in you know the circles that you ran, you actually can put things out onto social media that would be potentially attractive to a future employer as long as they're honest and authentic to who you are and what your actual skill set is. So you have this sudden new way of looking at things that you do have to kind of become a little bit of your own marketing and PR person, especially when you're looking for a job. And to segue slightly, uh, one of the passages in the book, uh, which I love and I want to get into a little deeper uh, is as follows. Our great challenge as we grow older is to stay connected to the light in our hearts and to bring that luminous energy into our work. So that's a wonderful passage. And you're referring to somewhat obviously in the fact that, you know, we will have ups and downs and sometimes the light is dimmed. Sometimes it's off uh, and our job is actually to ignite or reignite it. But if I go back to branding and positioning, there's a lot of older workers out there that are feeling that they're old. And they don't want to be viewed as old because ageism is sort of uh, defeating the opportunity to reignite or relight the the light. So I wanted to get your sense of how it, if it is our greatest challenge as we get older is to keep that luminous, um, glowing heart and light uh, lit. Tell us a bit about what we should be thinking about for the for the older folks out there. Yes. And well, I mean, I, I would love to even dig in with you further on this because you're, you know, really doing a lot of great work on that side. But I, I believe that, you know, the world and the world of business, the world of the world in general, obviously needs both that young, you know, experience and that young exuberance, but also the seasoning and the wisdom in the room. And so for the older, you know, people, who are listening and watching, you know, don't, don't lose sight of the fact that you have a lot to offer and that you are somebody who can be sometimes in, especially in the age of digital and AI and all the tech, you can be the adult in the room who's actually teaching them, the younger employees or people in the room, how to operate from a leadership standpoint, how to operate from you know, an experience standpoint. And so it's it's a beautiful thing when you bring the young and the old together and they want to learn from each other because we have a lot to learn from the young people too. Well, it reminds me of sort of the social science theory, um, fluid versus uh, crystallized intelligence, where fluid is really thought about as, well, the young people, they're so quick, they're so sharp, they can come up with ideas all day. Sure, that's true. And we may lose, as you get older, the fluidity of that intelligence coming quicker. But there's certainly the um, the absolute notion and re recognition that as we age, uh, we crystallize our intelligence and we come basically like a library, an encyclopedia of all this experience packed up. 
And I think that's one of the ideas that that might help uh, older workers in the positioning and the branding is actually to double down on that experience and to give more kindling to the fire of their light that actually that's something to draw upon as you position and brand yourself. So agree, disagree, thoughts on that? I just love the way you said that. It's so beautiful. The metaphor that you, you know, just pulled out really, truly. And I think it is, it's don't hide that Mm. experience, right? I mean, really own it, embrace it. It is who you are and you shouldn't shy away from any of those brilliant things that you bring to the table. Um, There was a, I remember being at a a luncheon many years ago when um, the publishing world was moving from print to digital. Okay, that will age me a little bit, but <laughs> um, Kim Kelleher stood up that day, wow. and she was she was the speaker, and she has been the publisher of many many very well known magazines, including uh, Sports Illustrated. But she said, you know, the thing that we're struggling with right now as leaders is helping the young people embrace the wisdom of the old older generation. Right. And helping the older generation embrace the wisdom of the young people, because when you think about the the gifts that each generation brings to an organization, those the young people might have, you know, five million followers on, you know, whatever platform they're on. But the older and I'm just going to say the more seasoned executives have the deeper relationships. Mm -hmm. They might not have five million followers anywhere, but they can pick up a phone, make a phone call and get something done. It's so true. I mean, the reservoir of contacts networks, which you make a good point about in the book as well, like, you know, uh, making your network, your net worth in terms of connecting and relating to those. It's such a, such a huge point. What I was also tangentially delighted to see was an entire um, step uh, titled find joy. And I love that because we, we, frankly speaking, we need more joy in our lives. But you point out and illustrate the fact that you know you 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 may make choices and get put into situations where you try something, and then you know the light might dim a bit. But you're like, at least I tried it. So maybe you need to find a way to get out of it to go make the light brighter, so to say. Now you specifically, Mary, come up or introduce. I'm sorry, a personal example which you do throughout the book, which is just great very vulnerable of you, but the WGN TV story is something I wanted to draw out from you. So listeners and viewers could sort of see the personal side of Mary and how you actually went through a dimming and then a relighting of your own light. Oh my gosh. Yes. That story. And I, and I'm, I'm so grateful to everyone at Tribune company and especially the leaders at WGN for giving me that experience. Mm. But I went from, you know, a job I loved in, in corporate um, as you know, the head of executive recruiting at that time, went and got my MBA. Tribune was amazing, um, very supportive of that. And then when I got out, my boss at the time, who is still one of the great mentors of my life, said, you need to get out of corporate. You need to get some business unit experience. <laughs> and so off I went to literally another pivot in my life from, you know, corporate executive recruiter to sales exec at WGN TV. And it was, it was a shock to my system because it was brand new. I mean, I was like a fish out of water there and the entire, you know, leadership group, my colleagues were super, super supportive, but I knew, you know, it's like that moment when you wake up in the morning and you're like, Oh, I have to go to work, you know? Yeah. I don't want anyone to ever have to feel that way. Right. And it was, you know, something that I loved the people. I thought, you know, the station itself was amazing. But knowing that it wasn't something where I felt like I was making a huge difference, that was one of the things that was so important to me is is having purpose and an impact on human beings. And this was more selling advertising. And so it was a very, very different thing for me. I did it for three years. I had an amazing experience but it was not, you know, my soul was not singing to me. Mm. And I was, I started getting sick. I started getting sinus infections quite a bit. I mean, it really, it really, when you're not doing something that gets you excited, I mean, you don't have to be excited every day, right? But, but 
you know, 80% of the time that you enjoy, it's hard to keep going Mm -hmm. and hard, you know, that light on inside. And so I, you know, I did my best. And then when there was an opportunity to go back into corporate, I jumped at it. And I, you know, I would say for everybody watching, listening, take the chance, be open to these opportunities because you never know where they can lead. I'm a better leader and a better person because of that experience that I went through at WGN. So if we play back your your computation for a second here, whilst you were getting a paycheck still from WGN, so take us through then your passion, purpose, skills, and, and personality. It might have equaled the paycheck, but it seemed like somewhere in there the math wasn't really adding up. So how, how, if I play it back to you then with the WGN, somewhere in yeah. there there's not joy, but you got some experience, et cetera, et cetera. So how did that all play out for you? It was a great experience in that, right? It gave me great experience. It was a stepping stone into what was next for me. But I, you know, I mean, I went from talking to people, you know, for a living, which is a lot of fun, um, to, you know, doing media math on an Excel spreadsheet and, (laughs) you know, like pounding the pavement and, you know, trying to get sales, um, you know, to get a spot on the WGN, you know, news. Right. so it was just a very different world. And my, my what I recognized was that while I am very strategic, I am not super analytical when it comes to spreadsheets and, um, you know, tracking things like that. And so it, you know, there were just pieces where I was like, oh, gosh, you know what, this is just it, it's not working for me, my soul, my brain. But once again, I knew I was getting really, really valuable experience. And I was willing to stick it out, out of loyalty to the company itself, but Mm -hmm. also to the people at WGN, I didn't want to disappoint them. And so that's, that's a whole nother, you know, kind of can of worms there, Dan, because I was so driven to not disappoint anyone, because I was given this amazing opportunity, that even though I wasn't loving it as much as I thought I would, I stuck it out to get the experience, to not disappoint people, to not let anyone down. And sometimes in life, you have to let people down in order to do what you love and to actually make a greater impact impact later. And, you know, as, um, as you reflect on a career and, and within the book and the writing of it, um, what are the lessons you would tell yourself back in the day, would you, would you not stay three years? Would it be two? Would you maybe not even contemplate the WGN TV experience? Was there something in there that a lesson as a leader that you are today that you sort of would advise as a coach to a younger Mary? Yes. Well, I, you know, it's funny because of course, hindsight is always, you know, 2020, right. But um, I, I wouldn't have done it any different. I mean, it was, it was not an easy three years for me, psychologically, physically, but I learned so much. And that's that's one of the other things in the book, right? Um, is that so many people think their career trajectory should just go straight up, right? And what the, the real truth is for you and I, and so many, is the path is circuitous. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are, you know, setbacks and there are twists and there are turns and all of that builds character and builds resilience so that we can actually bring that into what we're doing today. And so really interesting for for anyone is if you're not, you know, in love with the job that you have right now, what are the pieces that you can take out of it that are helping you build towards the future? That is a stepping stone towards what might be next for you. And then also, you know, another thing in the book, I I talk to people about a joy log. Yes. Right. And there, you know, there were so many moments of joy at WGN. I knew it wasn't fulfilling my soul, but there were so many moments of joy. And it's about learning how to embrace those moments of joy, even when some of the other work might feel tedious to you. Well, always in between the black and the white, there's gray and the joy can sit in the gray, even though it might not be absolute in the one of the zero, the binary, the, the black or the white. Um, Okay, so a couple more questions for you. Uh, The notion of employee experience came up, which I was delighted to see. And, um, you know, basically, you're referring to how 
people are kind of standing up and they're saying, look, I, I have value. I am valuable to you, the organization. I and But I also want to work on my own terms. So there's a bit of agency there, of course, but it is mapped back to, well, show me the employee experience money here, team. Like I need to feel as though that there's something going on. So what do you see as some of the good habits, practices, styles, processes, changes in organizations that have allowed people to stand up and say, I am valuable to this place and I want to do things on my own terms. How is this happening? Oh my gosh. Well, it's, it's this, you know, the, one of the silver linings of this terrible global pandemic that we went through, right. Is that because what happened was the playing field really equalized Mm -hmm. and people were recognized as human beings, not just workers. Right. And so you know, you'd be sitting on a Zoom and a CEO's, you know, child would come into it, you know, in their diapers or, right. you know, you're sitting, you know, on another Zoom and somebody's dog comes up and, you know, jumps into the camera. But, you know, you started to understand and learn more about how people operated, what was happening in their lives around, you know, at, from a 360 point of view, instead of just compartmentalizing work. And, So that also then allowed people to see working remote. They were still, I mean, for for the people who could work remote, not, Mm -hmm. you know, the doctors, the healthcare workers, you know, all of that, but working remote actually worked, right? And then, you know, when people were starting to be brought back into the hybrid workspace, that actually even enabled a, a greater, you know, kind of interesting phenomenon that started to happen is, People were excited to come back, but they didn't want to come back full time Mm -hmm. because they were looking at, wait, 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 I've now proven that I can get this job done while still being home to make it to my son's, you know, football game or lacrosse game. So there was a lot more humanizing that was happening and people were really reflecting and saying, okay, I can do this, right? I can work from home. I can still be productive. I can do all of these things. And I'm going to actually be even more appreciative of it now if you give me that flexibility, if you give me that chance to shine from the hybrid stage even. Yeah, totally. I get that completely. Okay. So my last one for you before we find out where to find out more about you and your wonderful book, uh, you, you do a wonderful job of eliciting the word grace and um, big fan of the word, uh, both verb and noun, basically, um, because you you make mention the fact that our our lights may be dimming, or even uh, you use the word flickering, which I just loved. So, what do you mean by giving one's self grace and the strategies we might employ then to be graceful to ourselves during these uh, dim or flickering moments? Mm -hmm. I mean, and that, that also too, Dan, is part of what we call humane leadership at Mm -hmm. our MVP is, you know, you're meeting your, you're trying to meet your people where they are, right? If you're a leader, but are you meeting yourself where you need to, right? And are you really, you think about how would you treat, you know, your employees? How would you treat your best friend? How would you treat your spouse or your child, you need to sometimes take a breath and say, wait, I need to treat myself that way Mm -hmm. as well and not pour from an empty cup, right? Because, you know, especially you and I, our generation, we're, you know, work, 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 work more, we get results. Well, what the younger generations are teaching us is that there's space in between to give yourself that pause and that grace so that you can come back to whatever it is and have that flicker turn into a brighter light. And so understanding that we all go through the ups and downs of life and understanding that even even the greatest leaders in the world have gone through ups and downs in their lives and how have they handled it and what have they learned from it and how have they come back stronger? That's by taking that pause, giving yourself grace, tapping into what do I need at this moment? And how do I, you know, really give myself that pause, grace, and actually patience, right? My own, you know, being, being empathetic to yourself um, to get back on 
to whatever stage or whatever bicycle you're riding, you know, whatever it is to get back on and to to come back stronger and brighter than, than before. Love it. And, uh, quite frankly, as a, my favorite band wrote a song called grace to you too have grace to Mary, um, Mary Wilson Menzel. Great to see you. Thanks for this. Uh, the book is of course, what lights you up? Where can we find out more about you and your fab new book? Okay, well, the book is available for pre-order right now on every outlet, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everything else. And if you go to the Mary Olson Menzel website, which is M-A-R-Y-O-L-S-O-N-M-E-N-Z-E-L.com, you can pre-order the book now. And we have a really exciting thing happening. You can actually download the workbook for free. Mm -hmm. you can start doing some of the exercises in the book even before you get the book on October 8th. Well, that's kind of fabulous. Everyone loves a a good freemium. Uh, Fantastic. Good stuff. Well, it's been a joy. Uh, Thank you for the advanced copy. I really enjoyed it. The methodology is uh, parfait and it's just crystal clear in its simplicity of what we all should be doing methodologically, ultimately, uh, to not necessarily think about the career ladder, but the career mosaic and along the way, making sure that we're lit up uh, throughout it all. Um, so kudos to you. What lights you up? Fab book. Uh, and thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, Dan. It was so okay. much fun to hear. Amazing. Okay, everyone. That was another episode of Leadership Now with me, uh, Dan Pontefract in the house, Mary Olson Manzel, the author of the new fab book, What Lights You Up. We'll see you on another episode soon.